Good morning, everyone. How's everybody doing? How are you, Joanna? I am well. How are you? Excellent. Uh, we're psyched to share this case study with you this morning um, and really kind of build on the advanced TV momentum that uh, we've seen here today as well. Uh, before we do that, Joanna, why don't you just position Modi in the marketplace and then I'll do the same and then, then we'll get it going. Perfect. Um, so Modi Media is a joint venture between Group M and WPP. We were founded a little bit over three years ago now. We launched three years ago at CES. Um, we are the advanced TV arm of Group M. So specifically, we are responsible for all, all things targeted. Um, so that's targeted television, including household level addressable, um, zone level addressable, um, addressable from a digital perspective or a mobile and tablet. So um, mobile addressable and high indexing linear where we can partner with um, local inventory aggregators such as Cadent to extend the reach of our addressable campaigns. And at Cadent, we have two divisions. First, we have Cadent Network that aggregates local commercial inventory from 200 MVPD partners. We do so with a high degree of automation. We offer a national footprint to our brand advertisers. We're big believers in reporting, visibility, and verification. All our plans are MSA posted. We offer an in-flight and post-flight -camp campaign and analytics dashboard. Uh, and the other side of our division is Cadent Technology that through data and automation essentially powers Cadent Network. And they're also a leading provider of dynamic ad insertion to the MVPDs. And we do work with Modi as well. So Joanna, you have a unique background having worked at DISH on the media side. Modi on the media side, you know, with an addressability expertise. So before we get into the case study, let's just talk about the marketplace a little bit. Here's a few facts. Uh, penetrations between 50 and 60 percent, about 55 percent. Uh, ad spend is estimated to grow from about a billion to two billion in the next two years. More MVPDs are lighting addressability. Uh, and interestingly, Adweek did a study that said 60 percent of clients are using addressable or plan to use addressable in the coming year. Those are all you know, sort of bright statistics. In your view, is this a market poised for sustained growth? And what are those key factors to sustain it? Yeah, absolutely. I think the marketplace um, for addressable is still poised for substantial growth. Um, I think at this point, a majority of the clients are no longer in quote unquote testing phase. Um, they've executed household level addressable campaigns. They've gotten the results. Um, they've seen the success. So now they're launching a larger scale, bigger budgeted addressable campaigns um, across multiple providers to really increase the reach of their footprint. So I would say the testing phase is, is, is pretty much coming to an end and, and clients are keeping it on their media plan um, as the year goes on and as the years go on. Um, the biggest point I think that helps the growth is, like you said before, when more MVPDs are cable operators, um, I don't want to use acronyms, I'll say operators, um, light up addressable inventory. Clients feel comfortable when they see a large reach so that they know that they're getting a, a large number of households within their addressable plan. It's not just you know a small fraction of households, it's really scalable and they're able to, to get um, the most out of targeting their uh, strategic audience. So the larger the footprint, I think the more comfortable clients see as putting it on as a viable option, as a, as a complement and a supplement to their national media plan. So you're really hiding, highlighting scale as a key factor mm -hmm. for growth. We do want this to be a conversation today, so we're going to come back to Q&A shortly, right after we take you uh, through the case study. So we are going to provide you a case study on an online flower retailer. Before Joanna takes you through it, here's just some facts on the marketplace. So the flower marketplace, and we think this is timely. Valentine's Day was last week. Mother's Day is coming up. Obviously, we all have to buy flowers. It's a $20 billion marketplace. Uh, it's really a marketplace that was disrupted in the late 90s by the entrance of the online retailers. The physical retailers and number counts are down. Uh, and mobile sales are absolutely critical uh, to this category right now. And The Economist describes the flower market as frenetic, competitive, multifarious, and beautiful. An analogy both for the advertising industry and the flower category. Thank so you. Joanna, tell us more. Sure. So we're going to walk you through a case study that we executed last year, right before Mother's Day, for an online flower retailer. 
Um, the push was to really drive incremental sales um, for their product and for this particular retailer. Um, they wanted to increase sales by stealing share from their competitive set, so increasing penetration, getting an increased number of households just buying from their particular site. Um, and again, these are pretty much things that every marketer wants to do, increase sales and, and steal from their competitors. So it's no surprise to everybody in this room, obviously, that there has been an influx of data and technology into the television marketplace within the last three to five years. So we now have access to data, both first party, which is client CRM data, um, email files, direct marketing data um, that we can leverage for targeting. We can also work with a number of third party data sets um, like your Experian, Axiom, Shopcom, Cartlytics, um, more and more come to the table pretty much every day. Um, and then we can target households that are in a brand strategic target, an audience. So you're no longer targeting households who are adults 18 to 49. You can really go below demography and target your strategic audience. Then using the technology from Addressable, we can do a closed loop sales analysis using the same first or third party data to see the impact of this addressable television or addressable campaign on the brand's key performance indicator, such as lift in sales, um, drive to in-store traffic, uh, lift in web activity, um, lift in brand perception, awareness, brand health. Um, so we can leverage all of this data to really understand the impact of targeted television and targeted media on a brand's performance. So at Modi, we don't just utilize addressable as it pertains to household addressable television. Um, this is probably the most well-known. Um, and as Rick said, it's currently in 57 million households. Um, and again, gives you the opportunity to go beyond demography and target a household. These ads are dynamically inserted in the content whenever and wherever that audience is watching TV. So you're no longer buying uh, GRPs, you're no longer getting a media plan that says you're getting two spots in ESPN Prime. You're truly reaching that target audience whenever they're watching TV. So the ad is always relevant because it's contextually relevant to that audience. The second bucket that we can also use, which was used in this particular campaign, is device level addressable. Right now we have access to 300 million devices that are mapped to 100 million households. And we can leverage the same data that we use for household level addressable to expand that campaign onto a household's mobile or tablet. So basically you can do one of two things or two things in general. Um, you can extend the reach of this targeted television campaign onto a mobile, ta mobile and tablet. So you're now reaching beyond that potential 57 million households. I um, mean, you can also garner true cross channel insights by measuring not only the impact of addressable TV, or just mobile only, but households that were exposed to mo both mobile and digital to see what the impact of that is um, on a, for your key performance indicator. And the third bucket here, which we also, again, use for this case study, is what we refer to as high indexing linear. So this is when, again, we can leverage the same first or third party data set, um, apply it to set-top box data, so viewership data, and identify the networks and day parts that over-index on that strategic target and create a media plan using partners such as Cadent um, to reach that audience in a linear environment. So ads are not dynamically inserted. This is a standard media buy, GRPs, media plan, MSA posting, um, and that's available in 100 million households. So again, that also allows a great reach of extension um, for that household addressable campaign. So Rick, anything you want to add? I think you, know, you really summarized you know, kind of our positioning as a complement to your addressable campaign. Uh, we have three products, a core efficiency cable product, a broadcast product, and the advanced TV product that we do conduct uh, in partnership with TiVo. And it really does help a marketer move that messaging through the funnel and complement, uh, as Joanna said, an addressable campaign as well. So taking a look at the buckets of the reach of each particular targeted media channel, so addressable TV is available in 48% of all U.S. households. So currently U.S. TV households are right around 119 million. Um, right now addressable is available in 57 million households and growing. So currently the inventory for addressable television lies within the cable operator systems. So that's um, Altice, which is formerly Cablevision, Dish, DirecTV, Comcast, 
Spectrum, which is um, Charter Time Warner, and Verizon Inventory. Device level addressable is available in 85% of all US TV households. So there are 300 million devices mapped to 100 million households. Um, and the inventory that we have access to for device level addressable are 30 second video units uh, within long forum mobile video. So that's pre-roll, mid-roll inventory. And high indexing linear um, is 100 million households. So that's 84% of US TV households. And that is the access to local television inventory through Caden. So when you couple and combine all of these different media channels, you can really build a robust plan that allows you to reach and optimize against your strategic target. So going specifically into this um, case study, so how we went about this is we leveraged Axiom data, and the target here was online flower purchasers or households who are in the market to purchase flowers for Mother's Day. Now, this is an extremely specific target, um, and I think it's a great example of just how specific you can get with addressable targeting. So you can pretty much leverage any kind of idea of data that you are thinking of. So you, know, you can do households in market for an auto, um, households who you know, are in market for a home. So you can leverage pretty much any specific type of data to get to your strategic target. We then um, mapped these to addressable TV, high indexing linear, and mobile by using device IDs to find the total qualified households that will receive this targeted ad. And we identified 16 million qualified households and devices that were going to receive this ad for this online flower retailer. So just getting into a little bit of detail about how we go ahead and find these, um, the specific audience. So for the addressable television and the addressable mobile tablet portion, um, we take that target that we found from Axiom and match it up against the subscriber file from all of the cable operators. Everything is stripped of personally identifiable information. So everything is done anonymously so we never know exactly who it is. No one's ever gonna say it, it's Rick that we're targeting. Um, and then once we identify those households, we dynamically insert that ad um, to that target household on TV, whenever and wherever they're watching TV, regardless of network uh, or day part. And we also insert it on their mobile device. And then Rick will take us through the high indexing linear. Part. So how we complement the addressable is we use the same Axiom data uh, and we couple it against set-top box data. And what that provides us is an optimized schedule that really lists the highest ranking networks and highest ranking day parts for that Axiom target of flower purchasers. Uh, the standard demo was adults 25 to 54, but we were, what we were really striving for here was that strategic target and identifying that strategic audience. And we tended to find that audience in the news category, CNN and Fox were some of the representative networks across sports as well and some lifestyle entertainment. So after we went ahead and performed this match, um, again, anonymously, I can't reiterate how important that is, um, these are the audience that we found by channel and that were exposed. So there were 8.1 million households that were exposed to this campaign only on addressable television. There were 527,000 of them on their device, uh, so mobile or tablet only. And then there were 182,000 households that um, could have been exposed to the ad both on their television through addressable TV or on their device. Um, and that's the audience that we can leverage for cross-channel measurement. And then there were 7.8 million households that received the ad um, through Cadence platform from the high indexing linear campaign. So then to go ahead and see how this campaign performs. So this campaign was extremely successful and the client was obviously very happy. Um, there was a 161% increase in sales rate. There was a 141% lift in penetration. So the campaign was successful at the key performance indicator as outlined by the client. So they did increase their sales um, and they were successful in inc increasing their penetration. So they were able to get more households um, to buy the product and it was by stealing their competitive set. I mean, you're, you, people are buying flowers. It's just a matter of where they're buying from. Um, well, if you're a good person and get your mom flowers from Mother's Day. Um, there's $25.4 million in total campaign sales, and there were $15.6 million in incremental sales. So just to pause here and talk about how we get to incremental sales. 
So every addressable campaign that we execute, we use a test versus control methodology. So what that means is we take a portion of that target audience that we've identified and purposely don't show them an ad. Um, that way, on the back end, when we do any kind of measurement, we can look at the behavior of the target test that was exposed to the ad versus that of the control. So that really allows us to see on the control side, okay, like what was the behavior of the target households if they didn't see an ad? So this is just their inherent behavior. And then how did households that were exposed to the ad perform um, from a sales or a behavioral or a store website visit um, perspective? And the difference between those two um, groups is the incremental sales. So those are the sales that we can directly attribute to the addressable campaign. Taking a look at the return on ad spend, so it, the return on ad spend was $8.64 in sales generated for every dollar spent. And then if we break it down um, by channel, so you can see that the device only was $6.25 for every dollar spent. Um, the TV only was $7.39 for every dollar spent. And then the cross screen was $7.36 for every dollar spent. Um, so you can see that device alone did drive um, healthy incremental sales. Um, but when you couple it together with television, you really have the ability to, to even make a stronger impact by reaching them cross-channel. So that's the positive story there. And, and I know that, in Joanna, this is an online retailer. Uh, many addressable campaigns are run in the automotive category and the financial category. But are you seeing new and emerging addressable categories and new categories of business being attracted to addressable? Yeah, so as you mentioned, auto and financial are two categories that have really strong data. Um, automotive data that you can get through Polk or Experian Auto actually allows you to leverage um, you know, DMV level data modeled um, to find households that are in market for a specific auto. Um, for finance, you know, finance industry has such such a robust amount of information on first party lists. They know who has their, who are banking at their banks, you know, going after competitive conquest. But we're, we're seeing an expansion into categories that maybe don't have strong first party data. So consumer packaged goods um, are a big, are a big category because, you know, if you're, you know, Pepsi and you want to steal share from Coke, you can really refine your target to households that are light medium, are light purchasers of Coca-Cola and steal that share. Um, the pharmaceutical industry is another one that's emerging, um, mainly because one, it's another great story for addressable. I mean, either you suffer from allergies or you don't. Like you either suffer from migraines or you don't. So why advertise to an entire population that's never gonna buy your product? Um, and again, there's strong data in the marketplace for that through CrossX, IMS, Medics, and you can use Shopper Data, Shopcom, NCS to identify for over-the-counter. Um, so that's, that's definitely an area that's growing, um, especially because the um, cable operators, um, are, uh, their technology has evolved to light up 60-second units um, for addressable. So that was a big hindrance before is that pharmaceutical ads are 60 seconds long. I mean, you need like 30 seconds just to get through the, the, the side effects. Right. Um, I think that as long as you have a refined target that allows you to get actionable results on the back end, addressable is a great, a great avenue for you. Talk about the client perspective from addressable. Is there a real recognition of the value of addressable and the role of personalization and the one-to-one -one benefits from the brand side, or is additional and further education required? So I think client education is always important. Um, you know, we always look at addressable holistically in our marketplace. We don't, we don't propose things on an operator by operator level. So we always present the marketplace to show the true scale and reach of addressable. I think clients have seen the benefit just in the granular detail of reporting that you can get. I mean, the sales data and all of that information aside, which is really great, I mean, even the basic idea of getting a really detailed impression report that you can get out of Addressable, so, you know, where were your impressions on what networks, you know, work the best, what day parts, and that you can use that information to refine um, some of your other media approaches. And then from the sales side, in the sales reporting metrics, I mean, you can also see, you know, did this work? Did this actually drive people to, to create an action? Um, how much additional money did I make by doing this? And you know, we can also look at you know, what networks and day parts were the most effective at driving sales. So you can use that information to further your media plans in the future or, you know, or refine and optimize. Um, so I would think that, yeah, it, it, client education is important because 
it, it's always necessary to show the value that addressable can bring, um, not only to driving your sales and, and helping your business, but really and helping you shape some of your other media proposals. And in a media market that's had a pretty good amount of media inflation, it's been a healthy market, do clients have a greater appreciation for the, the eCPM of addressable, addressability yeah. in that context? Yeah, so going back to client education, um, yeah, there is a premium to addressable. You have to pay for the data, the technology, um, the, the, the reporting, um, all of that that goes into it. Um, we do a lot of work um, showing clients that when you're comparing it to a national media spend or a national CPM, that it, it is effective. You know, when you're reaching an audience and, and you're looking to, to find people who are in the, in the market for an automotive, like a luxury auto, the people who just drive Audis, and you're having a national campaign, and you're spending $10 on a household. Like, that's all well and great, but what is it actually costing you to reach that very specific audience that maybe might be 10% of the entire US population? I mean, you could be paying $80 just to effectively reach that audience. So we show that you know, through Addressable, we can come in under that or around that and really, and really explain to them that you know, while it may appear on paper more expensive, it's, it's actually not. It's, it's pretty efficient. And you mentioned the pharmaceutical category, a variety of data sets there. Are you seeing new entries and new entrants in the data categories? And do you scrutinize the data as much as you do the potential media partners? Absolutely. So there's always new data coming into addressable television. I mean, there is a ton of data partners that are available in the digital world. And now there are a lot of them trying to foray into television to try to bring some of that data they have from the digital world and, and marry it to television. Um, we scrutinize it you know, pretty much the same way we would anything else to make sure that the data is sound. How are you collecting it? You know, like, you know, from a digital perspective, are you collecting anonymous cookies or are they authenticated cookies? We're making sure that everything is like, quote unquote, kosher when it comes to the data. Um, we want to make sure that the data also drives actionable results. Like, how does it work? We're not going to uh, recommend something for a client if we don't know that the data is the most granular and targeted that we can get for that particular client, because then the reporting and the results um, won't be as good on the back end. So we do take a look at every single one that, that comes to us and presents their data to make sure that it will work for our clients and that we're comfortable um, with the data. Now there's an art and science to this, and we've focused really much more on the science, but how much focus is there on the creative? Because obviously, you know, in personalization and messaging and sequencing, uh, creative's not cheap, it's expensive. Yep. So how much, you know, deployment of various forms of creative in a given campaign is there? So, I mean, in general, the clients typically, as you said, creating a new creative for a, a, a television campaign is definitely not cheap. So clients generally utilize the same um, creative that they've executed on their national campaigns on addressable. Uh, it's then the result of the increased frequency of that ad on your high-valued household that is creating the increase in sales and the lift on the back end. It, we don't. We don't say that you need another creative. I mean, would it be nice to then, you know, you're identifying moms with kids, and would it be nice to, to refine that, that creative to, you know, show moms with kids or to be a little bit more personal to that specific audience? Sure, but, but it's not necessary. It's just getting your messaging to your strategic target um, at an increased frequency to then, you know, have them see the spot and say, okay, yeah, I'm actually gonna go buy that product. And we talked a lot about growth factors, but you've been in the marketplace. What are the obstacles that we all should be very well aware of and also be working to solve for? So I think, that's kind of a loaded question, so let me think. Um, the obstacles, one, are, are, are client education and, and making sure that everyone knows what targeting and measurement capabilities that we have. A lot of times, um, there is an inkling to equate addressable to either national or digital. Um, it's not national television and it's not digital. So it's, it's, it's allowing clients and, and, and agencies for that matter to see that you know, it's, it's a blend of both. You know, you're, not, you're not buying GRP, it's like I can't, I can't get you that, I can't get you post logs. You know, like, and then on the digital side, like, I can't optimize in real time against key performance indicators. You know, the plan is self-optimizing because it's always reaching those households when, when they're watching TV. So it, it's allowing people to understand the combination and the benefits that, that Addressable has by kind of combining the national um, television scale, like it's TV, it's in your household, it's engaging um, with, with, with digital. So I think that's the biggest barrier. 
How about your forecast for 2017? Um, yeah, I think the addressable marketplace, you know, will continue to grow. I mean, we've seen great growth at, at Modi. Our, our clients are comfortable. Um, they're, again, they're no longer testing. They, they put on the media plans quarter after quarter. Um, I think we'll start to see more cable operators come to the marketplace and light up inventory that will grow the reach and scale of addressability even more. Um, and I also think that there's probably other avenues like, like the mobile and tablet space, um, you know, maybe you know, OTT lighting up some, some data that will allow them to become addressable. So I think that the market will grow on the, on the TV side, but also start to expand outside just your traditional um, living room television. Excellent. Well, the scoreboard's telling me we've got to start wrapping it up. We thank all of you for your time uh, and thank Gabe and his team for hosting us here today. We appreciate it.